amazing guest that we are welcoming all the way from the other side of the world and his name is Master Wizard over on Zell Ravenheart. Now, if you don't know him, I don't understand why you don't, but let us introduce this amazing soul to you. So Oberon is a modern Renaissance man, a transpersonal psychologist, a metaphysician, a naturalist, a theologian. I have to read all of these. Excuse me, but if they're wonderful and I need to say all of she them. She didn't memorise her script, no. just saying. <laughs> A shaman, an author, an artist, a sculptor, a lecturer, a teacher, and an ordained priest of the Earth Mother Gaia. Among the many projects he has undertaken in his lifetime, Oberon is one of the founders of the Church of All Worlds and the first publisher of the Green Egg magazine and headmaster of the Grey School of Wizardry, which we are going to ask you all about and the founder and curator of the Academy of the of Arcana. So those who know him will consider him to be a true wizard. And we thank you so much, Obron, for your time this morning. How are you? I'm very well, and I'm delighted to be here. Thank this is great so to have my time. virtual presence all the way back to Oz. I know, Something right? <laughs> very appropriate about that. <laughs> right. Well, you're, you're certainly looking well, which is great. And we understand that you've had a, a bit of a trip yourself to um, start this part of your journey elsewhere in uh, America. And we hope that um, you now enjoy where you are at and that it is really the start of uh, some peaceful existence there uh, and far away from any of the troubles or issues that might be around um, that area. Yes, um, I'm in a very nice um, place far away from all of the chaos and catastrophe that's going on out there. It hasn't really reached up here in this beautiful paradisal valley um, about 30 miles north of Seattle, Washington. So mm -hmm. that's my new home. Wow, that's that's really great. What What do you... What are your thoughts about everything that is happening at the moment? It's it's quite chaotic everywhere. There is so much happening and so many changes and, and so much anxiety and stress and anger. What are your thoughts about everything that is occurring? Well, you know, for the past 20 years or so, I've been talking about the 60-year cycle of cultural renaissances. And um, uh, the last one was, of course, the 1960s. And, I can, and I've traced these back 600 years to the Italian Renaissance of the 1480s. And just like clockwork, every 60 years. And this one just came right on target. And it's opening in a spectacular way. I mean, it's obviously the beginning of something new. And, of course, people say, well, it's the end of everything. But, you know, like Augur said in The Dark Crystal, end, beginning, same thing. Yeah. You know, it's a cycle. And the, and the, and the wheel turns. And we as pagans are used to the concept of the wheel turning. It turns on the annual wheel of the year, and it turns on the great wheel of the ages and the epics. And But a lot of people really um, don't, don't, haven't paid a lot of attention to the 60-year cycle, which I have. So watching this unfold as it's coming now is like clockwork. It's I'm just watching, okay. And, of course, I have a certain deja vu having been here 60 years ago it seems very familiar to me. What I see happening um, on a on a meta scale, really, is that um, well, the, the, each of these different cycles has had a name that has been given to it, and there have always been names involving things like awakening and dawning and stuff. Well, the last cycle was called the New Age, and the one before that was called the Golden mm -hmm. Dawn. You know, and uh, they've all had names like that. And this one has been given the name The Awakening, which I think is very mm -hmm. appropriate. I think that we are on the threshold of a new scale of planetary awakening. And Gaia, who is my major, uh, you know, thing in my life here, is my little image of her. Um, this is the greater body, the greater organic body of which we are ourselves this the whole entire little biosphere of the earth is, she really is literally a single living organism. And like any living organism, uh, she has immune systems. We do. 
if we have a disease or something that really needs it, we've got antibodies and things that are marshaled to come forward and try to combat this. And we really have to look at humanity on the planetary scale. To a great extent, we've been behaving like a cancer, you know, reproducing out of all control and dumping toxins into the system. In a body, that's how it's going to cancer. And I kind of feel that of which there have been a number throughout history, are uh, Gaia's immune system trying to defend herself mm -hmm. and respond to healing the um, disease that she is inflicted with. But this one is unique. There's never been anything like this where the entire world is brought together through this. It's the shutting down of the entire thing. It's, some of you may remember that old movie from 1950-something called The Day the Earth Stood Still. Yes. And, and this is the year the Earth stood still. You know? <laughs> it's, it's epic. And, every, and, and it's just bringing us all inward, a time of reflection, a time of, of um, you know, like if you're going to embark upon some great new quest or adventure, the typical thing to do is to have a night of vigil beforehand where you stay up all night and meditate and pray and, and consider now what you're going to be coming into. And all of... Humanity throughout the globe has been put in individual. You know, the tarot, this is the hanged man. You know, this is not the tower mm. exactly. This is the this is the period of the hanged man. And we are in suspension. And during this time of suspension, it becomes to consider who we are and what we're doing and what we're supposed to be doing and what are we here for and where do we go from here and and all of those kind of things. And I think people are doing that to an astonishing degree. And I, I think this is an amazing time, a time of transformation. And you know, the, one of the key mythos that we've all seen with is the legend of the you know, that it consumed in flames, all burns down to ashes, and then out of those ashes, you know, a new phoenix arises. But in order for a new phoenix to arise, first the old order has to be burned to ashes. And I think we're seeing that. We're witnessing the, the um, obliteration of a previous order, a previous way of thinking, of being, of doing. And out of this, something new will arise. And right on this is going to be the 2020s, the, the decade of the awakening. And I'm, I'm really very, very excited. And, and quite, um, it's, you know, it's strange to have we're getting some issues with audio kind of at the moment, overall, so I'm, I'm sorry about that, but um, we're, we're having a, a little bit of difficulty hearing you. So just keep going, uh, but we just um, say sorry to those that are listening. Um, um, it, it's something out of our control. Many of them have actually said they can hear fine, okay. um, so hopefully it's just our end that we're having issues. Yeah, we'll yeah. just keep going. I just hope, okay, well, I, I I hope, hope so. humanity um, can rise. That's my my thing um so many of us are tied up within ourselves and what we want i just hope we can rise yeah well this this situation brings us to a new level you know the uh, the chinese word for crisis uh is made of two ideograms meaning danger and opportunity mm. and, and i think we really have to look at it that way too you know there are just so many examples and we've been in the stories and the, the time that that uh, of crisis and the new heroes have to arise and and go forth to do whatever they're supposed to do and for those stories there's always you know the wizard in the story you know who, you know teaches the young hero what he needs to know and then sends him off to do his thing you know so um, those are the people who who live through the previous cycle 60 years before who came of age in that cycle so I'm watching a new generation coming of age now, and I really am pleased when I see these post-millennials. They're really amazing. They're out on the streets right now uh, demonstrating and championing for a revolution and social justice, and, um, and they're, they're the new heroes. I, I think they're wonderful. And we have to pass the torch to them during these coming years. You know, very few of us uh, old members are going to still be around at the end of this particular decade. But if we can pass on our wisdom and our experience to the next generation, then the whole cycle will continue and turn and new revolution will begin. 
and and we will move towards a global awakening. Mm. And uh, I think that is where our our whole, uh, uh, I guess, the advancement of us as a whole human race together is heading. We need to understand that we are all one now. The the world is smaller than it was from the point of view of the amount of people that are on it and uh, we are not small clans uh, distanced from each other anymore we are in each other's face continually and we really need to work as one mm -hmm. unit rather than all of these little tribes that are um, fighting desperately for um, positioning and for sort of some sort of global um, uh, ruling. Uh, America doesn't look the same in anybody's eyes as it did 50 years ago. It is it is not the great country and it is not the great power that it used to be. And uh, I, I think that some people are finding it very hard to let go of that type of a uh, vision that they still have of that country because it's just not, it's, it's fallen into a place where it's just so difficult to watch what is going on and in Australia, we're seeing this all the time on our news, so it's it's quite a shame. Yeah. Well, certainly, um, a lot of us are not at all happy with the way our country is being represented to the world with its current administration. Mm. And I don't want to try to get into a political no, rant, no. but I'm I'm sure that you sympathize. You know, it's an embarrassment, actually. Yeah. What do you think each of us personally can do to assist this awakening? What what can I or Anne or anyone do from our point of view to make our space a better space? Well, you know, the one of the great magics that we have as people is storytelling. And I think that this is a great time for us and instead of just passively receiving whatever is coming out out there, to seriously talk to each other, share the ideas and the thoughts and the considerations with each other. We now have this incredible global network. It's like a, a telepathic network that unites all of humanity. We used to imagine in the last cycle, 60 years ago, we imagined the future awakening as a kind of a telepathic emergence. But what has happened is that the emergence of the internet has supplied that very vehicle for a global neural network and we can tap this. So, uh, you know, get off of playing video games and start talking to each other. Um, and, we, and we can plant seeds. You know, each idea that we get, we pass them on, we pick up new ones. We, you know, we can be like a bunch of bees, you know, fertilizing and cross-pollinating from flower to flower. And, and good seeds, good memes will pick up. They will get they will find fertile soil and they will germinate they will sprout uh, it's new gardens new forest, as, as has been happening actually over time uh, but this is a participatory game you know it's not just a passive thing each of us <coughs> can participate in this process of planting seeds and nurturing them into a new a new world a new a new fruition i have a question here for you uh what are your thoughts on mother nature needing to cull the numbers of humans uh, of the human race well i that's kind of gets to what i was just saying before about this being a um, uh, example of gaia's antibodies trying to heal the cancerous disease that humanity has inflicted upon her um uh, we have really just gone all out of control with this. Mm. And there are various ways that populations of creatures are reduced when they get to be too messy, like the rabbits in Australia, for example. Mm. Uh, diseases come up for them, like myxomatosis for the rabbits, you know, and it cuts them back. And, uh, you know, we have our own ways of doing this. We have wars, and and then there's nature things, of course, that uh, like plagues and famines. But... Uh, something has to happen. This is not a sustainable situation that we can just keep on expanding our population indefinitely. There's over 7 billion of us. Mm. You know, Morning Glory and I, my, my beloved life mate who died a few years ago, uh, used to say, well, you know, sometimes it's just you and me against the world. And there's 7 billion of them and there's only two of us. So we're going to have to rely heavily on the element of surprise. <laughs> Which I, I think we did and, and have done. And we'll to do. You've done that very well. <laughs> yes, I'm rather pleased with that. <laughs> I 
actually love that saying. I thought, think I might keep that as well because, um, yeah, let's let's surprise Go the crap it. out of them. <laughs> oh, thank you, Tamara. I appreciate that. Okay. Oh, that's nice. I like the comments people are having. That's very nice. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, great to be able to pop those up. And thank you, Chrissy. I I love the planting of the seeds as well. And yeah, uh, depending on what you feed those seeds is depending on how good your harvest will be. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And I think I really think that's kind of what I've been doing with my life is I've been mm. planting seeds all my life. And I've lived long enough to see those seeds germinate and become a great forest. I mean, you know, um, last cycle around, I was the first person to claim uh, the word pagan as a, as a religious identity. And I, so it really all began there in September 7th, 1967, when I Somebody asked me, what was kind of religion was this that I was starting with my this Church of All Worlds thing that I created? And I said, well, I guess you could call us pagans. And nobody had ever said that before. Nobody had ever claimed to be pagan. And now uh, this is huge movement throughout the world. In the United States alone, paganism is officially considered to be the second largest religion yeah. at close to 4 million of us. I mean, that's astonishing. And i you know, and, and I've, this is the forest that I've planted in my life, yeah. and I'm seeing it grow, and and it's wonderful. It's a wonderful thing. Now, tell us more about the church that you did create. Sir, the Church of All Worlds. I'm really very proud of that, too. Here's our um, our, our oh, symbol. Is, yeah. There you go. See? And um, that started... <laughs> uh, we'll... A lifetime of of uh, obsession with myths and legends. It was what was the background, of course. I started off my earliest reading as a child was children's versions of the Greek myths, and I, it took me long before I was ever old enough to go to Sunday school. I was reading about the myths and legends of all people, so I completely was fascinated by all this, you know. And that led into fairy tales and more myths and legends, and eventually to fantasy and science fiction. And as I was um, getting older and growing up, I came upon the writings of a science fiction author named Robert Heinlein, who throughout the 50s wrote a series of a dozen juvenile fictions that were sort of the Harry Potter books of my generation. Mm -hmm. You know, we waited for the next one each year, a new one would come out. And these were all lessons. They were lessons uh, like all good books for kids, really. And what does it mean to be fully human? And science fiction provides an interesting perspective because it can give you in comparison to what, you know, in a way that nothing else can do. And um, so these carried me through the 50s. And I was in high school in the 50s, just like in all those TV shows and movies and stuff. And uh, went on to college in the 60s, kind of archetypal era. And at that point, the new book that came out in the series, the one that capped it all off, was one called Stranger in a Strange Land. And this hit me like a ton of bricks and everybody at that time. And if, if you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. But try to get a hold of the original 1961 edition because a, a later version was was uh, published uh, 30 years later by Mr. Heinlein's widow. And it's really just the unedited version and it doesn't have all the same stuff. And it kind of has a lot of things that go nowhere because... Um, uh, he edited the original tight and made it just perfect. And in the process, came up with some really good insights that are not necessarily in the original, the unedited manuscript. But it laid out a vision of a different way of looking at things. It laid out a vision of imminent divinity, the concept of thou art God, thou art goddess. You know, we all share that. It laid out a, a, a ritual of, of water sharing, sharing water, the universal medium of life, you know, throughout mm. the universe. And... Um, that was an important part of it. It introduced the concept of priestesses, which just didn't exist anywhere else at that time. And, and many, many, many other things. It's a powerful book, powerful book. It had a huge influence in the 60s, um, shaping to a great extent the, the fundamental philosophy of the era. And in the book, the um, there is a church that is created from all of this stuff. And they call it the Church of All Worlds because the hero... Uh, the main protagonist of the story was the child who was born on the planet Mars as the result of the first attempt to for a human expedition, which failed and everybody died, except for they found this, this one baby was able to be rescued and saved and brought up by 
an ancient Martian race that lived beneath the surface that nobody knew about. And so they raised him in their culture, the same way we go to the jungle and get a chimpanzee and bring him back and raise him up in our culture and teach him how to how to talk with sign language and, and make things and wear clothes and all that stuff. Mm. And this is kind of the story. So 20 years later, another expedition finally makes it successfully, and they find this kid and bring him back to Earth. And from there on, the story really gets interesting because he sees everything through this perspective. And so does the reader. See, that's the interesting thing is that the reader becomes part of the, the companions that go along with this journey of discovery and looking at things for fresh eyes. And, you know, we, we look at our culture from inside. How can we do otherwise? Yeah. Like a fish in water. And science fiction can give us that perspective of stepping outside and seeing our culture from outside of it. And so for the first time in science fiction, topics of sex, religion, politics, relationships were addressed with alternative perspectives. Mm. It was very profound. So the Church of All Worlds was created in the book to assimilate the best of all of the different religions and, and concepts into something that made sense. And, we, and, and the formula is provided for how to create such an entity. Mm. So we did. Wow. Yeah. Tamara wanted to know how hard was it for you at the beginning starting that church? How much resistance did you get? You know, that's the amazing thing. We really got very little resistance, but we, we started slowly. We didn't come bouncing out with the thing full-fledged mm -hmm. because, again, it's not full-fledged in the story, you know. Um, there's a lot of room to innovate. Um, and we started off with just uh, creating a water brotherhood, sharing water with with an ever-growing number of people, which is the way the story goes. If we just follow the story, really, until we had enough people to decide that, well, it's time to bring this out to the world. And so we we did, and we filed for incorporation. And at that time, of course, in the beginning of the 60s, there were all kinds of new religious uh, sects and cults popping up. I mean, there were Scientologists and Moonies and Krishna people and all sorts of them. And that's, that's actually what led to the... Uh, the pagan identity. People said, well, are you one of these Eastern cults? Are you some Christian, you know, sect? Or what are you? And that's what I said. Well, I, I guess you could say we're pagans because that was, that drew on my uh, background of mythology, world mythology. So the idea of, of drawing upon the roots of all humanity in uh, the myths and stories and legends and customs, all of our holiday customs, all of our folklore, all of our you know, so much of our songs and music, they all have pagan roots, the so holidays especially. It's yeah. a big one. Mm -hmm. And we know that. But the rest of the world did not know that at the time. They were just going on about this stuff. So getting back to the roots, I, I feel that the pagan movement in its in that we initiated there was one of seeking out for our heritage, our lost heritage, our lost roots, which, you know, actually are titles of other novels by, by Heinlein, interesting enough. He, had one called Lost Legacy, and that was also inspiring. Um, so when we came out with this, people were just interested. You know, they were very curious. We got uh, interviews, got things on the local radio show, newspaper stories. People were very curious. And I'd go on, I'd talk about this stuff, and, and people thought it was pretty cool because we weren't trying to tell people what they had to believe or how they behaved. We weren't telling them to give us all their money and... and uh, and do all the stuff that other groups were doing, you yeah. know. And um, <laughs> it was about good. think for yourself, you yeah. know, take responsibility, you know, and all these pagan values oh, that we all hold in common. Heavens to Betsy that we should and, uh, uh, take responsibility for our own, own actions. Imagine that. Oh, imagine awesome. that. <laughs> How adults do you really want to be? <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I had the amazing a thing is it's worked. It's, it's actually worked. And these values and visions – have infused a growing number of groups and empowered people to go out and, you know, find their own group or start something based on and Greek or Egyptian or Norse mm. or Celtic or Druidic or whatever works for them and to go with that. And yet we're still all part of this larger, you know, pagan umbrella. And there's a sense when we meet each other, we, you know, we see it in each other's eyes. We have that sense of recognition. I always wear my pinnacle out and I recommend people to do that because, you know, so many times I've gone into public places, right, exactly, <laughs> oh, you know, and, and, and people will see my jewelry, and they will say, 
light your jewelry and they'll pull out theirs, you know, <laughs> and there we are. And we are everywhere. We are just everywhere. Yeah. And let's be even more everywhere. <laughs> so Steve, everyone yes, we yes. turn is one for our our, our side. <laughs> Stephen from the Buckland is. Museum is saying hello there. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> right. Hi, Stephen. Yeah. And uh, Chrissy is saying yep. thank you for your gift and your knowledge and wisdom and healings. You're very much oh. appreciating it. Um, I think this is what everyone is actually doing. Yeah. And Tony, Tony from the oh, uh, Tony. Buckland. Hi, Tony. Hi, Tony. Um, she we haven't said it off yet. <laughs> That's <laughs> vodka he's Museum drinking, too. actually. <laughs> That's not water at all. But, you know, the, the delightful thing for me is that I've been around since before the beginning, and I know all these people. You know, the <laughs> yeah. whole, you know, all, all, all of the leaders and founders and teachers and everything. These are my people. These are my friends. I've, I, and I, what an honor to have such incredible company of my my friends and co-conspirators and the unindicted co-conspirators. Absolutely. The, the unusual <laughs> subjects, you know, <laughs> suspects, unusual suspects, as it were. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful. What a wonderful community. Yeah. And what a privilege to be a part of it. Yeah. You know? And I get to kind of be like, you know, inviting grandpa to Thanksgiving dinner. You know, I don't really have any responsibilities there. I don't have to cook the turkey. <laughs> I just kind of sit there at the head of the table and say, Right on, kids. You're doing great. I'm <laughs> really happy to be here. Pass the turkey. <laughs> now, when did you commence the uh, the Gray School and start writing all oh, of the yeah. books? Oh, this is. I was very excited because I actually have one of these books. When I started my Pagan Path oh, a few years back, this was one of the books yeah. they recommended. So to actually have you here today is like, uh -huh. there it is. Yep. There it is, right? Yep. Well, that started in, um, let's see, uh, that was a result of the first Harry Potter movie that came out. And Morning Glory and I were invited to come and give a talk to a, a Jewish shul in San Francisco. They, were, they had bought tickets for everybody to go to the opening night of the movie. They'd reserved the entire balcony. And they wanted to have a real live wizard and witch to come and talk to them beforehand so they would know what, what this was going to be all about. A lot of people were really worried, is this going to promote Satanism or something? Oh, yes. so, so we did. We gave a great talk. and we, we came in full regalia and had a wonderful time, and everybody enjoyed it. And then we went to the movie, and we loved it, of course. And, you know, and I'm looking there around, and the whole thing was full of, of uh, you know, pointy hats on very short people. And um, <laughs> it was very cool. And we're thinking, wow, there's all these kids, and they're going to become looking for the real thing. Yeah, you know, because well, in, in yeah. the, it's not that hard to find. There are now occult stores in every in every town, and there's usually something on the bulletin board that will mention about classes or events that are happening. But nobody was letting the kids in. You had to be 18 to get into any of these. So where are they going to go? He said, "Well, we, um, what can we do for this?" And at that point, what we were doing was we were making altar statuary. So we decided we would make some altar statues for kids that would be a, a, a kid's god and goddess image. So he made a, a kind of young Diana and young Pan in a sort of a Disney style. And we went that summer to the annual um, uh, New Age trade show, the International New Age trade show, which was in Denver, which we had been going to for years with our merchandise to, to sell it and stuff with these new pieces. And at that point, uh, uh, Patricia Telesco, Trish, came up to our booth, and she had been brought there by her publisher for her latest book release. And she had published something, 60-some-odd books. She herself didn't remember how many. And so I congratulated her, and she said, well, when are you going to write your book? And I said, well, I don't have time to write a book. I'm doing statues. I'm publishing a magazine. I'm writing editorials. I'm doing all this stuff. But, you know, books, you know, I don't have time for that. She said, let me introduce you to my publisher. So she took me over to the new page booth and introduced me to their acquisitions editor. And she gave this glowing thing about me saying that you got to get this guy to write for you, you know, and she said, okay, we'll sit down and if, and tell us um, if you're going to write a book for us, what would it be about? And I hadn't really thought about that, but I ins kind of inspired and said, well, you know, I'd love to write a book on uh, kind of a handbook, a, a, a manual, like the Boy Scout handbook on Real wizardry, the true stuff, the real stuff. You know? <laughs> Great. And and, they, and I went off on this. I'm just making it up off the top of my head. And they loved it. And they said, well, 
sent us a proposal, which I did, and they hired me to do the book. And uh, it took a couple of years to get it done. So it actually got published at um, on Bridget's Day, the 1st of February oh. of 2004. And as I was wrapping it up and working with the Gray Council, a whole, a whole number of the elders and mages and sages in the community, which were kind of a, a, an advisory council, I basically told all these people, I said, let's put together a book that we wish we could have gotten a hold of when we started off yeah. and that we want to make sure we get a hold of next incarnation, yeah. you know, that would be all of what you should know when you start out. They said, cool. And that's what we did. So then I realized that, well, this is a textbook now for a school. So I figured, well, I'll, I'll refer the readers to some online schools they can go to. And I discovered that there weren't any that met these needs. They were either for adults only, or they were specifically some particular religious group was having their schools to teach their religion. And I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to have it be sectarian. I didn't want to have it limited to one perspective. I wanted it to be available to anybody. So I figured, well, in my life, my life has been guided by assignments from the goddess. You see, I'm, I'm on her majesty's sacred service is how it goes. And um, I get these phone calls calls you know this is the goddess speaking your next assignment should you choose to accept it and and you know the thing about this thing is you have to accept it because if you don't then they just cancel yes. your show <laughs> you know? they can, they, 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 the gods don't want to watch you just sitting at home on your ass watching no no, no hence no. the reason so, we um, are doing this show because we got that call <laughs> exactly exactly I, I think we all know what this call is we've all yes. got it right? <laughs> They're like, I got it. I got the call, you know. <laughs> so I said, okay, um, I guess if it's a thing that needs to happen and nobody else is doing it, then I guess this is an assignment. Yeah. So um, that's what I did immediately after that. I started talking to other people and members of the Great Council, and and we agreed and set it up. And, uh, oops, lo and behold, uh-oh, I just lost uh, the whole thing here. What happened? Oh, uh, no, we can see you. We, we've oh, good. you. Oh, good, because my screen just, for some reason, went blank. Well, that's okay. You can still see me. Good. Yes. Let me yeah. know that. That's odd. I wonder why it went blank. Anyhow, um, so we opened the school at Lunasad of 2004, the Gray School of Wizardry. And, and it was quite an ambitious project. And we expected a whole bunch of kids, you know, escorted. I envisioned all this for teenagers. Although when the book came out, I was starting to see reviews, and they were all about. Well, I had to buy extra copies for my grandkids because they keep stealing mine. And, and, I, and, I, and I came to realize that there was, this wasn't just for kids. And we were somewhat surprised when three quarters of the students sending, signing up for the first year were adults. Yeah. And they were saying, well, this is the stuff I wished I could have gotten a hold of. And now that it's here, I'm in. So we had to retool and reconfigure our programs and our offerings. Presently, about four-fifths of our students are adults from, you know, all the way up into their 80s in some cases. There are some that are older than me, even, which is amazing because I'm older than dirt. But um, <laughs> but it's been phenomenally successful. We have uh, 16 departments and over 500 classes and, wow. and seven year levels, uh, and they're uh, towards a uh, journeyman certificate. It's an apprentice program. And we have amazing teachers and amazing administrators. And the key person in, uh, in, in keeping the whole thing going, or well, the key people are really, it's our amazing administration, our, our, our dean of faculty, Ambika, but, um, and our dean of students, that's uh, Emrys, and, um, uh, and of course, our amazing provost, Professor Nicholas Kingsley, who is, uh, at 26, the beginning of the next generation to pick this up and run with it. And he is awesome. He's also my personal apprentice. He's taken a personal apprenticeship oh, wow. with me. So, you know, I'm, I'm looking over. He's my Padawan, you know. <laughs> I'm very, very proud of him. He's, he's awesome. And so, it, you know, it's all part of the whole um, plan to pass the torch to the yeah. next generation. Because if somebody doesn't pick this thing up, it's going to go yeah, out, you know. True. We're losing our elders. I'm you know, we've lost so many, as as you know. Every time I turn around, somebody else is gone. And I'm pretty much the last one standing. 
you know, and there's I just think this hardly is anybody the, left. One of the reasons why Lady Tamara wanted us to start doing this was to reach out to the elders of the community and share the knowledge with the, the new generation that's coming through, uh, the seekers that are out there. And uh, I know I learned so much. I'm a seeker myself. Um, so it, it's it's just so wonderful to hear all this knowledge and the comments that are coming up down in here as well as people are saying that you're um you're giving them perspective on uh what's happening at the moment which is amazing mm. well good uh, i'm glad to still be useful after all this time you know um that's a very good thing and uh, and i but uh, the main thing is that i am so proud of the community that has emerged the incredible people the the, the wisdom and the heart and the caring and and the beauty and the love and the joy and and so many things that this this whole community has brought forth into the world it's it's been a well of course right now we're at the beginning of a new cultural renaissance but the last one has been going strong ever since we kicked it off 60 years ago and it's just become more and more beautiful i, I mean i'm overwhelmed i go to a festival in the you know the and the people the costumes the rituals the art the music it's breathtaking it's just mm. unbelievable what a privilege to be a part of all this it allows us to also enter into um that part of ourselves that is still childlike and still innocent and still believes that the world can be a beautiful magical and wonderful place and I think as, as adults, we still crave for it just because we get past the age of 20 or 25 or 30 and have to go about our mundane world and go and work and do all the things that we need to do to survive and to keep our families going. There, there is always a part of us that still yearns for that uh, fantasy, the, the Disneyland and and all the things that we could do and could be and could enjoy. And uh, this path certainly allows us to engage in that. And I think for all of us as adults, it, it makes us more well-rounded people to be able to say, no, we don't have to escape from that. We can still do it. And it can make us better people. And as it should, as it should. And that's the whole the whole idea of all this. I see a note from Tamara who yes. wanted me to ask yes. about the Church of All Worlds in Australia. And yes. that, that goes back to our first visit really there, which was in 1985 on the Great Mermaid Expedition, which is another whole story. But we spent a little time in Australia. And um, apparently it's that time served to inspire some folks to get uh, – to, uh, a pagan thing going there that was based on the Church of All Worlds. It has grown. And right now, uh, I believe that the president of our uh, CAW Australia is Martha Brabinaw and uh, Peter, uh, Martha Brabinaw, and Peter Brabin is one of our priests there. So, well, and and uh, other people, because I've been there back and forth a few times. So we have had quite a group. At one point, some of the largest gatherings, pagan gatherings in Australia were the Church of All Worlds uh, summer gathering. PS, the Pagan Summer Gathering, PSG, every January. And I've, I attended a few of those, sort of Morning Glory, and we did ordinations and meetings and stuff. So they're pretty independent. Uh, that's our whole idea, is to kind of seed things and then encourage people to take them and run with them. So, um, but they, they're still, we're still in touch, you know. They send us their newsletters, and we keep up with stuff, and we're still, still going. The Church of All Worlds was apparently the first... Um, uh, non-Church of England church to be legally incorporated in Australia, which was, mm. I think, 90, 90, 91, something, or somewhere back there. I don't remember right off him, but it's right in there. There we go. Yep. Well, you can do that, Kathy. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, there, you can look up the, the Gray School of Wizardry and um, you can actually do your courses online. It's I was in there the other day going, oh. oh yeah. <laughs> but also it's, it's so wonderful. Yeah. With this um, magic uh, yeah. realm of the Internet, we've we, mm. it's international. The Gray School, as well as the Church of All Worlds, is global. We have students in every country, in China, Brazil. We have huge numbers. Uh, my books have been translated into a number of languages, so each of them has has stimulated a whole new uh, group in those countries, respective countries. Uh, China's been having a hard time lately. Our Chinese students are having um, the government is shutting down internet communication with the outside world. So 
it's a real struggle for our Chinese yeah. students to be able to get us. But we have a virtual school in Second Life, uh, a, a virtual campus that they can access. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a little trickier because it's real time and you have to actually be there at the same time mm -hmm. as the teacher is. And with international stuff, that means sometimes at two o'clock in the morning in one place is middle of the afternoon somewhere else. But it's happening and it's working and it's a global community that we've created with this. And I'm, I'm again, I'm very proud of it. I'm, I'm really ridiculously proud of the stuff I've done and the people that I've been involved with. It's what a, what a privilege to be given this assignment. Thank you, goddess. You know? <laughs> now tell us a little bit about this mermaid story that you hinted on just when you came up. Mermaid that's, expedition. Yeah, that, that's, that sounds fascinating. What happened there? Well, I'll, I'll have to, that, that was what came after the unicorn adventure, which is another story. There's so many stories I have, I've had. So you know, for a while we raised unicorns back in the eighties and, and um, uh, at, in 85, we successfully negotiated a, um, a exhibition license with the Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus. And we said, well, we got that done and now we got some money. What do we want to do with it? And at that time, there were reports coming out of um, New Ireland, which is a little island off the north coast of New Guinea, of, of these sea creatures that were described as mermaids. Uh, you know, fish women is the word that they use, fish Mary in the uh, local pigeon. And said, so, well, let's, get, let's you know, take this money and make up an expedition, and a diving expedition, and go see what we can find. So we did. We all got licensed uh, as scuba divers, and we rented a, a dive boat out of um, out of Sydney. We flew to Sydney, and we uh, took off from there. And it was quite an adventure, another epic adventure. And eventually, we uh, we made it to the village where the sightings had been done, and we found the creatures, which turned out to be the Indo-Pacific dugong, which. Um, was somewhat of a disappointment when we were looking for something brand new. We were hoping maybe to find, you know, some aquatic ape because we were all into the idea that our the human features, the webbing between our fingers and all the rest of the mm. stuff that we have, you probably are aware of, are all aquatic features. Mm. It must have been acquired in our ancestry. And so we envisioned, well, what if those, you know, we all came back to the land, but maybe we didn't all come back to the land. Maybe some of us stayed in the sea and continued evolving like many other mammals have done that went from the land to the sea you know like dolphins and otters and whales and and all these guys so that's kind of what we were thinking we were going to find and in a sense we did uh really and um there was a tragedy there because while the time we were in the village one of these creatures was shot by a um, a little japanese tugboat that pulled up alongside our boat while we were there and disappeared in the morning and um, when we, in the, in the morning when the dawn came and we were out doing vigil looking for these creatures, which only appeared at dawn and dusk to come in to feed at the bottom, um, there, was, uh, there was this dead one. And it was the mother of a group of three that we had been observing, a male and a female and a baby. And she'd been shot. Mm. And the thing about it is that, these, uh, that the dugongs have breasts like a human in the same position. And so they sit up there in the water and they hold their babies up to nurse. Oh, wow. And the concept of, that, that permeated all of this is the idea that everything on land has its equivalent in the sea. So we talk about sea lions and, and um, you know, sea everything, really. You know, there's, there's the equivalent. Mm. And so that was the idea. So this was the sea woman because of the breast, mm. the, the fish Mary. So we learned a lot, and um, we made a report to the International Cryptozoological Society, and we returned home with a lot of video, which some of which has now appeared in the documentary of my life called The Wizard Oz, which you can look up. It's uh, put out by um, uh, Animal Productions, done by um, Danny Yord, Y-O-U-R-D, and if you look that up, you can see it. Or if you go to my personal website or the Church of All Worlds or the Gray School website, it's, mm -hmm. the video link is up there. So you can get the whole story of all this stuff. It was quite epic. And so, and so we came back and spent a week in Australia and made a lot of good connections and, and went home to a, another life. Yeah. So which part of Australia did you come to? 
Well, initially uh, we, we ran out of uh, Sydney, but then we, um, the folks that we visited took us all up and down the coast. So we were all the way up to Darwin, really, at one point. We visited wow. uh, zoos and stuff, you know, got to hang around with roos, which I loved. We got to cuddle koalas, which was really just just absolutely unbelievably sweet. I mean, you know, you see these koalas in these movies and pictures, and they look all soft and fluffy and stuff, yeah, they and don't. they lie. <laughs> they're, they are softer and fluffier than you can possibly imagine, although they, they do, I understand, have somewhat nasty tempers, but we didn't mm. actually encounter that. And but, we, we um, have gotten, we've, sorry for interrupting, we've gotten to a point here where we have lost so many um, because of the fires earlier on this uh, year that... Oh, right. The fires burned where, through the eucalyptus. Yeah, oh, yeah, it's just, it was so pitiful to watch these, all the oh. animals trying to get out of the forests, but the fires were just so intense that they just, yeah, it's awful. And also it burned their food source because they can only eat a specific type of eucalyptus. So um, they were starving. Yeah. Those that were left. It was just that is so awful. sad. That is really, really sad. They are such sweet little creatures. Yeah, the fires. The, wow, the fires you guys have had down there, the fires we've had up here too. I mean, California was all the flame last fall. And um, wow. And South America, my goodness. I saw some satellite photos of the earth and, and Africa, South America, Australia, the United States are all just a flame. It's been unbelievable. And, and this summer is predicted to be worse, they're saying. So it's kind of a lot is going on. A lot is going mm, on. A lot of changes. It's a big cleanse. Mm. It is. It is that. I and have I to ask you. To look at it that way. Yeah. Yeah. I have to ask you about your headpiece that you were wearing. So, what oh. is this? Well, this is my um, uh, kind of priest crown, as it were. It's got the um, antlers of the horn god. You know, there's two uh, crowns that are typically worn: priest and priestess. And the priestess one has a crescent moon. And the priest one has the antlers, and it's that's what it is. Do you have a favorite god or goddess? Uh, and, and I shouldn't ask that, but I'm intrigued uh, that you kind of go, oh, I just really love that energy, or I love the story behind it, or, or whatever it might be. Well, obviously, I have imbued myself in world mythology and have found many gods and goddesses that I really feel close to, but Gaia is certainly the, you know, she's my, my you know, main love, really. She is yeah. the devotion of my life and my work. She revealed herself to me in a profound vision I had just 50 years ago in 1970. Mm -hmm. And it was, um, it's been written up lots of places. I won't try to give you the whole story, but I, um, I perceived the entire uh, life of the earth all originating half a billion years ago with the Cambrian explosion and um, uh, and then and I realized that this was exactly the same as the moment of fertilization that gives rise to each of us as individuals. When an uh, uh, ovum from our mother and a sperm from our father unite to create a zygote. And from that point, the proliferation of all the trillions of cells that make us up all begin with that single point. But we still remain a single organism because we all come yeah. from that same point. And I realized that by that same token, all life on Earth was literally a single organism because it all originated at that single point. And we all have that same DNA, the same particularly unique gene complex, the homeobox gene complex that, that appeared. And we have, uh, we even have, uh, you know, one particular little interesting little creature that you may recognize, the tardigrades that have been with us all that time since that very beginning. And these little buggers are designed to live in space. You know, they, they've taken them up on the space station and put them outside. And wow. and they, you know, and they don't have any problem with that. Total vacuum, uh, hard radiation, you know, extreme temperatures doesn't phase them. They're found all over the earth, everywhere, in every environment, from the bottom of the deepest parts of the ocean to inside volcanoes to living at, underneath the ice sheets of Antarctica. There's over 1,700 species have been identified and we've just recently become aware of these, just in the last few decades. They're about the size of the um, of a pinpoint. They're very tiny, mm -hmm. really. Wow. Yeah, but they're actually quite cute. You know, I don't know if you can see the whole. Yes, we can. It looks a little bit like a witchy grub. Yeah, that's what I was thinking it, it too. It does with legs. I, yeah. I, I think that they look like the uh, creatures of um, of Barsoom from the John Carter novels. You know, but 
but whatever it is, they are uh, still with us, half a billion years. And um, we have a question from Lady Tamara for you as well. What are your plans for the uh, next couple of well, years? I think she's well, I have work list. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's fine. I have, I have many more books I want to write. I've got a list, and I've been working on on many of them. Uh, so I've so all of them are partially written. I want to get them all out. I'm, I've just recently moved to this wonderful new place uh, called the Longhouse in um, in Washington, and it's um, like 87 acres in this beautiful resort uh, retreat center place, really, wow. and uh, lots of beautiful uh, shrines all over the place. There's a big stone circle in the yard out in front, with giant stones, and it's a wonderful place. And it's been just they invited me to come here. They wanted me to be here, so here I am. And so I'll be devoting my uh, time to, you know, bringing what I can to here, creating rituals and, and festivals and events and workshops and seminars and, and bringing people into the space. And uh, that's going to be nice. And writing books. And I, I'm looking forward to getting a studio again so I can get back to doing sculpture. It's been 20 years since I had a studio. This is the very last piece that I made. And it was 20 years ago. So... I look forward to making more. I've got more gods and goddesses standing over my shoulder saying, me next, you know? <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. So i got to do that. Another question here for you. I'm sure your book has changed people's lives. What book changed your life? That's a good <laughs> well, question. Well, that's easy. As I said before, I mean, more than any, the single most impactful book was Stranger in a Strange Land. Mm -hmm. And I... Uh, and you, and you kind of get that same response from pretty much anybody who's read it. I've heard, I don't know how many people say, oh, yes, that book changed my life, too, you know. So mm. it's one of those life-changing books. I've read thousands of books, of course, um, but that's one that had the greatest influence on me of any of them. Mm. Wow. Okay, well, we have taken up so much of your time, and we are just so appreciative of you uh, taking time out of your busy life to answer some of our questions and to be seen by those that are here in Australia. Um, like I said, sometimes Australia feels a very, very far, far place and disassociated from the rest of the world. Which is and... not so bad at the moment. Yeah, it's not so bad. <laughs> no, no, actually, that, that's not a bad thing right now. No. It really is. Uh, oh, yeah, the, rest, another question the rest of the world you. is going bugger up, you know, so you guys <laughs> I know. Uh, Lady Tamara really wants to see you very soon because <laughs> she has her list made up and I think she wants to hand it to you personally. She's asking, when will you be back in Australia? As soon as I get, uh, as soon as people br bring me in, you know, I mean, I will be delighted to go, but it's, uh, but I can't do it on my own nickel. So you guys get it together and buy me an airline ticket and I'll be there. Yeah. That sounds fantastic. Sounds like a deal. Yeah. <laughs> of course, Absolutely. of course, probably not in the next few months. However, no. all things mm. I don't think yeah. they're letting anybody yeah. fly anywhere right now. No. <laughs> the, the likelihood is, if you do come here, you'll have to stay here for an extended period of time because we'll have to look after you to make sure oh, well. that you stay healthy and you know don't get trapped into any sort of horrible diseases or anything like that. I keep so. saying I've got a spare bedroom. <laughs> Well, well, we will do that then. That's a wonderful uh, invitation, which I will be yes, delighted to accept. Apparently, we're going to PSG 2021. Uh, we're going to have all our out, all, all of our outfits or non-outfits ready. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm not going sky clad. This body is not ready for that. <laughs> Well, again, it's it's all about the invitation, you know. Yep. If um if if uh, I get invited to PSG twenty twenty one by Selena, I will be more than delighted to go. Um, you know, that's the way it works. There's three ways people travel: people are sent places, people go places, and people are brought places. Mm -hmm. And for me, mostly, it's it's being brought places. But I'm happy to go. <laughs> We are just so astoundingly grateful that you are here and that you have done a lifetime of work to assist people like us to really find our space and uh, our devotional life in this world. I, I just don't know, you know, if, if people like you weren't there when you were, where would we be now? Uh, we you would be somewhere. If you hadn't accepted the challenge. Yes. Uh, you've just made it so much more easier for people of this generation um, to be able to 
do what they need to do and to find their pathway. So we are eternally grateful and we hope that one day uh, we will have the opportunity to be able to give you a, a big Aussie hug uh, as we would love to do. So, yeah. So thank you so very, very much um, for your time. Um, I'm sure that everyone else has and yes, that they've been telling us how grateful they also are for having the ability to see you and hear you um, and uh, yes we we will say goodbye at this point in time please hang uh, we will get back to you but we also would like to just thank everyone for being online and please 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 share this interview with your friends or those that you think uh, may be interested uh, and yes let's change the world one by one because that is our task at this point in time oh, so thank indeed. you so much Oberon Thank you. So you, you stay there. We'll come back. I'm just going to pop you off the screen. And there we are. Now, guys, as you can see, there is so much valuable information coming through this channel. We need to spread the word. We need to get this page out to more people. So it's up to you guys to do that. We need you to spread the word and let people know. So share this uh, this interview that we've just done. Um, make sure you've liked our page. Um, and we appreciate you guys being here and absolutely and joining us for this amazing talk. Yeah, and remember, you can um, always go back to the other interviews that we have done, and we have many more planned with some absolutely fantastic people coming up. Uh, and thank you, Lady Tamara, for thank you, Lady Tamara. the opportunity to create this and run with it. And um, we are so thankful for being called. Yep, and with that, we're going to sign off.